Hi, and welcome to the Assembly Lines podcast. I'm Chris Torrance. In today's episode, I want to continue with my Apple II emulator in the browser. I'm going to add labels to my assembler, and then I'll also take a look at the performance and see how cycle counting on the 6502 processor can help us get better performance in the browser. So let's get started. Here's the latest version of my Apple II emulator in the web browser. It looks a little bit different than last time because I've gone ahead and done some CSS to make it look a little bit nicer. As you can see, I've changed the background color to try and match something like an Apple II Plus. It's probably a little bit too dark, but that's just fiddling with the CSS. I've also rounded the corners on the text window, and then I've added a margin so it's not quite up against the edge. If we go back over to my code, here's the CSS. So you can see I've added the background color here. Here's where I added the margin on the sides. And then finally, I have the border radius around the pre-HTML tag, which is what I'm using for the text window. So with that out of the way, at least we have something that looks nice. However, if we refresh the emulator, you can see that it's actually running pretty slow. So my machine code to do this is just filling up the text page one with the letters A through D. And this really should be blindingly fast on even an Apple II with a one megahertz processor. So I was a little bit puzzled and at first I thought maybe it was just because I was using the React JavaScript library and there was just too much overhead. However, once I started thinking about it, I realized that the real problem is I was actually trying to update the screen after every single instruction of the 6502. And this just isn't the way that it actually works. On an Apple II, the processor runs at one megahertz. However, the screen only refreshes at 60 hertz. So I was trying to update the screen thousands of times more than necessary. And of course, it just couldn't keep up. So I wanted to take a look at how the cycle counts on the 6502 tied in with the speed of the processor as well as the refresh rate of the monitor. Let's go look at my code right now. If we go over to my display file, this is where I actually have the code. And you'll notice there are some other changes from last time. I actually managed to add in labels to my assembler. So last time, if you recall, I just had to hard code in things like addresses. And this makes it really complicated to figure out where to branch to. So what I did in the last couple weeks is added labels to my assembler. So we can say here, there's a label called start. And then when we wanna go back to the top, we can just say branch to that start label. Similarly, here's the inner loop where it's just filling the memory. And we can actually do things like we can increment the location of that loop instruction plus one, and that would actually increment this zero zero here on the store accumulator. And then we can branch to that loop instruction. Over in my assembler file, I had to add quite a bit of code to handle the labels. And I tried to clean things up by using regular expressions as opposed to just doing string manipulations. So I won't go through all the details. You can actually go out on GitHub and take a look at my code. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm splitting up each line of the instructions into an optional label and then an operand as well as an instruction. And then for the label, it's actually pretty simple right now. It doesn't work quite as well as a regular 6502 assembler. So for example, I can only use labels that have already been defined. So I couldn't actually jump to say an end label down here because my assembler isn't smart enough to do two passes. To do that, I would actually probably have to make a, a, a double pass assembler where it would run through once, keep track of all the labels, and then run through the code again and actually fill in the addresses for those labels. And maybe that's a feature I'll add in the future.
So what's wrong with the performance of my emulator here? As I mentioned, it's really due to us trying to refresh the screen after every single instruction. And this is just not correct. So what I took a look at is how the number of instructions that get executed are actually related to the refresh rate. And the cool thing about a 6502, and in fact, any of the old 8-bit machines, is they're all single threaded. So you can actually literally count the number of cycles for each instruction, add them up, and that actually gives you the exact running time of your program, unless there's some sort of interrupt that halts the processor. So if we look at my program here, these numbers in parentheses are actually the cycle count for that particular instruction. So for example, a load instruction takes two cycles, store at an absolute address takes four, an increment of an absolute memory location takes six cycle counts. Here we have a branch, and if the branch is not taken, it only requires two cycles. If the branch is taken, then it requires three cycles. And then since this is just all one loop here, what I've done is I've added up the cycle count for that loop. So we have 255 executions of this particular loop, 13 cycles for each, and then plus an additional 12 for the very last execution of it. So that's a total of 3,300 cycles for this inner loop. Then we have the outer loop where it's incrementing the letter A to B to C to D. So that gets executed four times, plus a few additional instructions for the initial load and then the final branch that either gets taken or doesn't get taken. So if we add everything up, we get a total of 13,300 clock cycles, which should execute then in 13.4 milliseconds, given the speed of the 6502. Obviously, as we saw earlier, it's a lot slower than that. So we just found out that our sample program up above should take 13.4 milliseconds to execute. How are we actually doing? If I go back and look at my emulator, at the very bottom I have the total time to execute the program. And you can see that we're actually executing it in 12.4 seconds. So 12,000 milliseconds instead of 13.4 milliseconds. So clearly we're doing a terrible job. Let's go back to the program now and take a look at how we can improve this. If you look in the Apple II circuit description by Winston Gaylor, and at page 37, he talks about the number of refreshes per second that you should get from the Apple II display. And as you might expect, this works out to be approximately 60 hertz, at least on a regular NTSC Apple II. So we need to only refresh once every 1 60th of a second as opposed to every single instruction. So how are we gonna do this? Now, this is kind of complicated because my current emulator doesn't actually understand cycles for instructions. I don't have that stored with the instructions. And so it doesn't actually know how many cycles there have been executed. So rather than try and figure all that out and add that to the program, what I decided to do is just see, well, what's the maximum theoretical speed that we can get to see if we have any hope of reaching a regular Apple II speed in the browser. So what I did in my program is rather than processing just one instruction at a time, we can go ahead and we can just crank this up and do all of them for the entire loop. And I'm just gonna set this equal to 4,000 because I know that there's actually a little bit less than 4,000 instructions that need to get executed. So this is essentially do all of them. So let's go ahead and save that. And then if we go back to Chrome and reload the program, you can see now we're executing the entire thing in 46 milliseconds. Let's run it again. Here we got 39, 35, 36. So we're hovering around 30 to 40 milliseconds. And you can see that when I hit refresh, the entire screen is indeed being refreshed. You can see a quick flash, but you don't actually see any of the characters being drawn. And if you're actually trying to run this program on a real Apple II, you'll see the same thing. You won't actually see it drawing any of those text letters. So we're getting close to our 13.4 milliseconds, but we still haven't reached it. However, I have one more trick up my sleeve. If I take a look at the inspector for this, 
what I'm actually doing is just for debugging, I'm dumping out every single instruction as it's being executed. And it turns out that there is a fairly steep performance penalty for outputting to the Chrome console. Let's go back now to my program and we'll disable that. If we go now to where process instruction takes place and look at the bottom, here's where we're actually outputting to the console. So we don't want to do this. Now I've added a do debug flag and this is what we actually want to disable. So let's go now to my display and then when we start up the assembler, I'll just disable my set debug call. So debug will be false and it won't actually output to the console. I'll save this and now let's go back over here and refresh. And you can see now we're down to 11 milliseconds, 10, 5, another 5, 6, 7, 5. So we're now executing the entire program in approximately 5 milliseconds, somewhere thereabouts. So this is less than our 13.4. So I think we've actually achieved our goal of actually getting performance equal to or exceeding the regular 6502. Now, obviously, there are a lot of caveats to this. My program is only outputting text page one, and it's just doing that as a single giant text box here in the HTML. If this were on a real Apple II, we might have individual characters that would be flashing or set in inverse. And when we do this for real, what we're gonna have to do is probably actually draw this as pixels as opposed to text. And so this actually might really impact our performance. In that case, I still might end up having to throw out the React library and just go straight to raw HTML. There's still a lot of improvements that could be made. I'm not really paying attention to cycle counts. Now I'm just trying to blast out as many instructions as possible and then just doing a refresh. This is really just a proof of concept. What I need to do next is actually put in the cycle counts for the instructions and then try to actually time them so it's actually running at the proper rate. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. In the next episode, I'm going to continue adding instructions to my emulator, and we'll take a look at the addition and subtraction instructions, and also the mysterious overflow flag. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please hit the subscribe button below. Also, I have a Patreon if you'd like to support me that way. Patreon is a great way to support me. You'll also get your name and the credits and you'll get notifications about upcoming episodes. I'll have a link in the show notes. Once again, thanks for watching.